And so there just came this moment where I just kind of asked myself, I was like, is this the type of life you want to live? And the answer was a resounding no. And so, you know, when you decide that, you have to start making some decisions that to other people might sound selfish. But, you know, ultimately, the only person you can really take care of is you, like, period. And if you're not taking care of yourself, you're no use to anybody else. You can't really live your life for somebody else. You have to live it for yourself and in, in the best way you can. And that's, that's what I decided. Have you ever wondered what's behind the music of your favorite composer? Where does their inspiration come from? What do they stand for? What are they most passionate about? What's behind the name at the top of the page? My name is Jeff Herwig. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I'm going to bring you the answers to those questions and more. Welcome to Composer Disclosure. Hello friends and welcome back to Composer Disclosure. Today it's my absolute pleasure to be able to speak with composer, arranger, drill designer, educator, artist, writer, a man who can truly do it all, Randall Standridge. Randall, I truly cannot express how grateful I am uh, that you're willing to give some of your incredibly valuable time to the podcast. Um, thank you so much for being here. You know, as someone who's performed and conducted and been inspired by so much of your music, it's an incredible honor to have you as a guest. Well, thank you very much. All right, so let's get started with, with the first portion of the show and jump right in. This is where I ask you a few general questions that I present to each of our guests before we sort of take a deeper dive. Um, so my first question, what was your earliest inspiration to compose and not necessarily, you know, write music for other people to perform, but like your earliest memory that you have of wanting to create your own music? Okay. Well, that's, um, I, when talking about that, I think sometimes it's important to define like what type of person I am. Now, when I say this, it's going to make me sound really, um, you know, braggardly and, and like I'm, and I'm not, but this is because I mean, I would describe a lot of people like this, not just myself, mm -hmm. but um, I'm just a creative person. Um, and now when I say creative person, I don't mean that I think that everything that I create is great or that everything you know, that like I'm a genius, that's none of that, none of that. But what I mean when I say creative is that there is some impulse in me that drives me to create. And it always has, um, you know, some of my favorite toys when I was little were um, Legos because you could build things and create, um, you know, I love drawing and painting. I always have, even when I was little. And so once I, you know, got into music and started learning to play music and things like that, it was a pretty natural progression to not only want to do it, but to create it because that's just my personality type. And that hardly makes me unique. I mean, there's, there's, you know, tons of people across the world that love to create things and it manifests in different ways. Um, and for me, it manifested that way. Um, so uh, my earliest really memory of getting started was um, I taught myself to play piano because um, my brother, who is a really great guitarist, received a, an electronic keyboard for Christmas one year. And he was just not interested because, uh, I, you know, the, the thought was, oh, you know, he loves music. He's going to love this, but he wanted nothing to do with it. Like it, it was basically, oh, that's nice, but I've got my guitar. So it was just kind of lying around and I started picking it out and, uh, you know, picking out tunes that I knew or things that I'd heard on TV or on movies. And, um, you know, I didn't know it at the time I was learning to, uh, play by ear and dictate and do all this stuff but i was just like oh i'm just picking out this song you know and so of course it eventually just became you know it, you know it's kind of like how somebody goes through an evolution with drawing or painting generally speaking when people draw or paint at first they're drawing things they see or things they you know something that's already done like you might 
you know, somebody teaches you how to draw something or, hey, I'm going to draw this picture. But there comes that point where you cross over to, well, I've got my own ideas and I want to actualize those. And uh, so music became the same thing where I started, you know, writing, you know, little fragments, little melodies, little rhythm things. And it just grew from there. So th those were my earliest. That was probably when I was about, oh, nine or 10 years old. Was there a separate moment for you later on after that, after your first inclination to create music? Was there a second time later on that you were like, this is something that I'd like to do for a career to create things for a living? Uh, not really. Um, I always like to tell people that like I became a composer by accident. <laughs> um, and I mean, I'm being serious because to me, it, it, it was never a career goal. Mm -hmm. like it was it was literally just something fun to do and i mean i'm not being disingenuous like it was um so just to give you kind of an idea about how this happened you know we just talked about the start all through high school and junior high i would keep writing like i'd write some drumline cadences for you know when i was in uh in high school band um i even wrote a couple of percussion ensembles um, and wrote a couple of band pieces that were really bad <laughs> but um but you know there was still that it, to me it was just fun it was kind of like finger painting like it was like you know this is just fun to do um and i didn't take it too seriously which i think has played to my favor like even in my later career um so when i got in college or when i when i attended university um you know i, I went for music education i mean i was studying to be a music educator and um like i didn't even know that studying composition was a thing like, I didn't even know you could do that. So I got there and, um, you know, we met all the faculty, you know, they, they introduced the faculty to all the freshmen and they introduced a couple of the professors as, oh, well, these are our composition professors. And you know, I had, I was like, that's a thing. Like, I didn't even know you could do that. And um, so I went and talked to them. I was like, well, you know, I was like, I'm a music education major, but I would really like to study on the side just because I, I, it's fun. I think it's interesting. And um, so did that and studied with Dr. Tom O'Connor and it just kind of kept developing. And he, he thought I had a lot of promise um, and he was a great teacher. Um, and so then um, I get to my first band directing gig, which was my only band directing gig that I held for 12 years at Harrisburg High School in Harrisburg, Arkansas. And I composed for my band again, just because it was fun. And all this time, like it never occurred to me once, oh, somebody else might enjoy playing this stuff. <laughs> You know, so, uh, but, um, you know, I, I am married, I have a husband and one day he was just like, you know, you really ought to think about trying to get these published. And I was like, well, I was like, do you think so? And he's like, yeah, yeah. Is I, th I think it's really good. He said, I think you're better than you think you are. And, uh, so he, I mean, he's always my number one fan, my you know, biggest go-to. And so I started submitting things and got it published and the rest was history. So, I mean, there really wasn't a moment of like, oh, you know, I want to do this. It just kind of, I just kind of stumbled into it. Um, the only moment where it really became a decision was at the end of my teaching career. Um, it basically just became, you know, I, I mean, for all your listeners out of there who I'm sure quite a few are music educators, I don't have to tell you music education is a full-time job and it is literally a full-time job. I mean, you know, you have the work day, the sectionals, the lessons, the games, you know, all the stuff, and then all of the worry and planning that goes on behind the scenes. Now, when you do that and you mix in with it, a budding um, composition career that has its own demands, you know, with traveling, social media, um, doing the actual writing and everything else, correspondence, which takes its own block of time. Um, I mean, it just became where all I was doing was working. And I am definitely the type of person who wants to enjoy my life. I don't, I don't want to just work it away. Mm -hmm. And so um, there just came that point where it was like, I, I'm too busy. Like I either need to teach or I need to write. And so that was the only moment where it was like, okay, I am deciding to be a composer. Mm -hmm. You know, That's great. And actually that you answered one of my future questions that I had down the line here. So that's awesome that you alluded to that. Um, kind of tying back into that, you mentioned uh, Dr. O'Connor was one of your, your influences in, in your early writing. Are there any composers that you would say, um, influenced you so much that they're sort of like part of your writing DNA that there's a little bit of their work in yours? Well, I would say quite a few. And I, and I, I could, because I don't think it's possible, and especially when you're a composer, I don't think it's possible to hear music the same way people that aren't composers do. Uh, because to me, there's this constant analysis going on and there's this constant kind of breaking it down to its parts and, and basically kind of gauging like, how am I reacting to this? And so um, I would say quite a few, 
Um, I mean, just just among you know among them, all this is certainly not all of them. Um, I remember the first. I mean, I I think for a lot of the kids that grew up in the '80s, like I did, um, you know, the first big one is always John Williams, just because it's it's you know when you think about Star Wars, E.T., Indiana Jones, it's the music is so great and so powerful and just iconic that um, I think it's it's a lot of people's, in, you know, movies in general are a lot of people's introduction now into the world of composition because, you know, they, I didn't, you know, I'm just going to be blunt. A lot more of our young people today are going to know Star Wars theme than they're going to know Beethoven's Fifth right. Symphony. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> which is unfortunate, but it's the truth, mm-hmm. you know. And um, so, you know, John Williams was a huge influence just because it was like music, you know, music is great. This type of symphonic sound is great. Um I also just love, love, love Danny Elfman, um, you know, hardcore, but that's also because I'm a big like horror um, literature and horror cinema, you know, nut. I, I love that stuff. And so um, love his, his music uh, with Tim Burton. Um, and then another, I, it's funny, like a lot of my um, academic composer, composer and musician friends really kind of laugh when I tell them this. But um, two other really big influences on me um, growing up, one was Yanni, you know, the, the, the new age composer Yanni, because um, his music to me sounded exactly like what I wanted to create, which is pop meets symphonic. Um, you know, it's really fashionable for a lot of academia to really rag his music, but his music is incredible. And it's just, it mixes every culture of the world into one sound. Um, it's just it's magnificent and uh and he's just a cool guy so that was another you know composer growing up that i was like wow this is neat um and then another one is um earth wind and fire um you know the group from the 70s because their their music is just on a whole other level than other bands from i mean don't get me wrong 70s was a great time for you know rock and roll jazz funk horn bands in particular you know like you've got bill chase blood sweat and tears all these things like that but for me um Earth, Wind, and Fire, the way they mixed a world music sound with funk, with jazz, and all of this just texture and harmony, um, it was very affecting for me, because I was also like, you know, to me too, I was like, oh, that's what I want my music to sound like, you know, and uh, so, but then beyond that, it's just everything, like, I am constantly inspired by other writers and composers. Going along with that, is there anybody that you're currently listening to right now, maybe not one of those early influences, but somebody that you can't listen to enough of their music right now that's kind of influencing your current writing oh um, not really um, i tend to get more attracted to individual pieces um as opposed to like composers in general um let's we'll say right now i mean really i listen to everything um right now i find myself listening to a lot of heavy metal um i i grew up being a little bit of a metal head and um, i've kind of reconnected with my love of that recently and uh, so I've been listening to a lot of that. Um, I mean, I always listen to a lot of symphonic things. I'm constantly culling, um, you know, things for new symphonic band works, orchestral works, choral works, um, and just listening to what's new. Um, in fact, my favorite feature right now, yeah, I use Apple Music. And my favorite feature on it is they have this uh, feature called For You. And it will kind of like um, archive and select music based on your tastes. You know, there are things that you may not have heard and I'll listen to that every week. It comes out with a new list every week and I'll listen to it and, you know, just see what it is. And of course, you know, some of the things I like, some of the things I don't. Um, But that really, uh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm constantly looking for new music, Mm -hmm. but it's, but but my tastes tend to be all over the place. Um, So I've been listening to a lot of that, you know, a lot, a lot of heavy metal, I've also been listening to a lot of like folk and bluegrass lately. Um, in particular, uh, just to give a shout out to two um, two musicians that I really like. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this particular musician, but Trixie Mattel. I'm not. Um, Trixie Mattel is a drag queen that does country western. Okay. <laughs> and she, I mean, it's not just a gimmick. Like the thing is, like he or or you know she and her persona is just in, incredible. Um, I mean, just a great musician, great music, very and, and very great lyricist. Um, his lyrics in particular are just spectacular. Um, and then, and it just flew out of my head. I'm pulling up my iTunes so I can give you, <laughs> give you the right name. Uh, Will Stratton. Okay. Will, Will Stratton. He's kind of an indie um, folk, folk music, uh, bluegrass artist, plays guitar, is just incredible. 
and has this very melancholy uh, sensibility to his lyrics and his overall style. And it's just, it's very arresting. Mm-hmm. It's just really cool. And then uh, last is uh, a group called Airlands, I think. Um, they're kind of new. I found them on SoundCloud. And it's just a cool sound. So those are the people I'm listening to right now, but that's going to change next week. Right. <laughs> like I'm, 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 I'm worse than a magpie just picking up, you know, something <laughs> shiny and running with it. That's good though. And I'll make sure to link to all three of those artists so that people can maybe discover them for the first time and enjoy that too. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're gr- great, great music. Yeah. And your, your eclectic taste in music really um, shines through in your album, which we'll talk about in a little bit because there's a little bit of, of something throughout the entire thing, which is awesome. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, moving along to the next question here. Um, I know that you've written for uh, like a myriad of different ensembles in terms of like size, ability level, um, even like from marching band to concert band, orchestra, chamber ensemble, whatever it may be. Do you have a favorite medium or a favorite type of ensemble to write for? No, absolutely not. Um, I am happy to write whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, sometimes when you find success in a particular genre, you know, like I have in concert band, um, I think people tend to identify you with that so strongly that they forget that, you know, you're a composer. Like, I mean, I don't consider myself to be a band composer. I am a composer who happens to write a lot for band. But I've also written string orchestra. I've written full orchestra. I've written choral works. I've written... Um, some movie score stuff, you know, I've written some just experimental stuff. Like I just like writing. Um, and if you're going to be a working composer, um, you take the gigs that come to you, which for me right now is concert band, you know, and, but, um, if, you know, I was suddenly discovered in the choral community, you better believe I'd be writing a lot of choral music, um, or a lot more because, you know, you write where the gigs take you. Right. Um, I think sometimes people have this romanticized idea of composers where it's like, oh, you know, they got inspired by this. So they wrote that. And it's very nice for people who can do that, that have like a college job. I am a full time composer. <laughs> I take the gigs I get. I mean, now mm-hmm. don't get me wrong. I get inspired sometimes. And I, you know, they're passion projects I have that I work on. But I also take jobs that will just pay the bills. You know, right. um, one of my actually one of my favorite things I wrote this last year, it was a real fast job. Um, you know, one of the things that's going on uh, right now is there's a lot of new schools being built in Texas. And I got contacted by a middle school. Hey, we would like for you to write us a new fight song. Like a fight, you know, fight song for their football games because they wanted something original and something that would, you know, not be like anybody else's, but still fall into that style. And so, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a, you know, not a long gig. It didn't take me very long to write, but it was fun. And so, you know, there's a lot of academic composers that might sneer at something like that or be like, well, that's beneath me. If you can write music, then do it, you know, Um, because sometimes, you know, I I tend to like throw the gauntlet down a little bit. I'm like, just once, some of you, I would like to hear you write a melody just once, you know, because, you know, my thing is, if you can write a Christmas medley, you can write anything. question has to do with the current uh pandemic that's going on so if you're listening in the future this is recorded in september of 2020 um something i've struggled with since march when america basically shut down overnight was remaining creative when my entire schedule sort of flipped upside down um and i know every time i'm i'm on facebook i see that you're constantly writing um constantly putting out new things was there a secret to you remaining creative through through the whole shutdown up until now? Well, um, I, I mean, I, I think it's probably a variety of things. I don't think it's any one thing. Um, on the one hand, um, I think the biggest thing is that my schedule was not really interrupted um, because you have to keep in mind that I work at home. So, you know, for some people who might have other gigs or might have other things, you know, and their entire life was upended because like they're suddenly not going to university, they're suddenly not doing this other thing. And they were having to make a lot of adjustments. Um, my adjustment was, oh, I don't need to go to you know restaurants. 
Right. <laughs> and so, yeah, well, I mean, so, you know, there really wasn't a big adjustment for me other than just, you know, I mean, it was scary, you know, it was stressful, but, but my day-to-day -day life really didn't change that much. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is I just, um, I don't get writer's block. I mean, I just don't like, I, and I know that, that, that again, that's not to make me sound like greater. It's just, it's a fact. I don't get writer's block. Um, my, I have the, whatever the opposite of writer's block is, that's what I have because I have, I am never short of ideas. I've got a, uh, I've got a list of projects that I want to write, like my, you know, my idea notebook. Mm -hmm. And one of the most depressing things about it is I will never live to write all this music. <laughs> like I just won't. And so, uh, so I've, you know, I mean, I've, always, I've got a plethora of ideas. I'm, and I'm also very good about managing my time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, I, I don't know. It just, it, I just basically pushed through and worked through it um, and just tried to find escape in the work, you know? So, uh, you know, it's, it, I don't know. I've been busy. I've been writing like crazy. I think since the pandemic started, I've got, oh gosh, I've written about 12 new pieces. Um, and then, and also, and then, you know, I gotten all my stuff ready for next year's uh, Grand Mesa marching catalog. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been a lot <laughs> well, then and had to rewrite stuff for flex since that's what's going on right now. So, um, it's been, it's been pretty busy, you know? Yeah. So if anybody out there knows what the opposite of writer's block is, please let us know. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the nicest term I had for it was writer's diarrhea, but I don't really <laughs> think that's probably the best term. You know, I was going to say something similar, but I didn't want to offend you since we just met. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, last question of this, this general portion of the show that I ask everybody because I'm taking sort of a general poll. Um, what is your music notation software of choice? Well, for me, it's uh, Finale, um, mainly because I've used it since 1995. And I'm, I mean, I'm very familiar with it. So like, you know, one of, I've got a bit of a reputation in the marching arts community and in the composition community, not only for, you know, writing good music, but for writing very quickly, um, because like it's nothing for me to sit down and just rip out a piece of music, you know, like like that. And which again, that's part of the gig. You know, sometimes you need to do that. Um, but um, I think part of the reason that I'm so fast is just because I know this program inside and out. Like Finale to me, I can I can almost write at the speed of thought with Finale because I'm so familiar with it. Um, if you put me on Sibelius. Um, not that there's anything wrong with Sibelius. Sibelius is fine. I mean, a lot of a lot of composers use it, um, but just the unfamiliarity of it, not knowing how to make things work. I mean, it would probably slow me to a crawl. Right. You know. And so I, you know, I'm I use Finale, but I'm not like a fanboy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. I, I mean, it, I'm just to me, it's like having a favorite hammer. If this hammer works for you, great. If you'd rather use this hammer, that's fine. As long as the work gets done, I really don't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that seems to be the general consensus. I use X because that's just what I was taught to use first. Right. Um, I personally bought Dorico about a year ago, tried to use it, got too far behind on certain projects, and yeah. I don't even write nearly as many things within a year as you do. And that was too stressful. So I just went back to Sibelius. <laughs> yeah, I've, yeah I, I have not tried a Dorico 3 out yet. I've been considering it. Um, but at the same time, like, I mean, I'm so busy that it's almost not worth my time at this point you know um so I, and not that and again not that there's anything wrong with that program it really just you know i mean because i've seen people use muse school mm -hmm. and write great <laughs> stuff and it's like you know it's, it's really just whatever you need to use Something you, you mentioned earlier was that uh, prior to being a full-time composer and marching arts designer, um, you worked as a band director in Harrisburg, Arkansas. Did that experience of working daily with students influence your writing at all at the time? Definitely. Um, especially, um, I would say, in terms of orchestration. Um, so the, the position I held at Harrisburg was somewhat 
not really unique because I mean, I know that there's a lot of music educators in this situation, but you know, looking back, like it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me because uh, Harrisburg is a very small community and the school is very small. And so, I, I mean, I wasn't just the high school band director. I was the band director. And so like I taught um, the fifth grade music education. So, you know, I taught fifth grade recorder band a sixth grade beginning band, seventh and eighth grade middle school band, a nine through 12 high school band, music theory class, um, after school jazz band, you know, all this stuff like that. And it was all me. Um, so, you know, on the one, I didn't know it at the time, but, you know, I mean, I was learning acutely the way students need to develop and, you know, what their needs are from level to level. And that has definitely impacted my writing. Um, because number one, I mean, on, on a sheer practical level, I understand a lot of the um, idiomatic natures of the instruments um, and can write for them accordingly, um, especially, you know, for those particular age groups. And uh, then, um, you know, I also, it makes me, uh, well, what I like to tell people is like when I write a piece, the first time I write, like the first draft, I write it as a composer. And on the second draft, I edit it as an educator. And uh, because like, I mean, things I'll look for, you know, it's like, okay, is one instrument group getting the melody all the time? Is another instrument group never getting the melody? Um, you know, is everything, you know, logical and making sense um, in, in terms of instruments and finger positions and slide positions? Um, so, you know, I, I take that step. And so if you, if you look at a lot of my young band music, you'll notice I tend to, try, I'm not going to say I'm always successful, but I try to spread melodic lines around, you know, including parts for the low voices, parts for the mid voices. So it's not just the soprano voices getting the melody all the time because, you know, the kids need to develop that. And also I don't know any kid who joins band to play harmony. I mean, like, seriously, you know, I think we forget that sometimes as educators, you know, what attracts kids to band melody. Now that's not all they're going to play and that's not all they need to play, but that is the carrot. That is what they joined band for, you know? And so I think it's very important uh, in repertoire to engage students, to make sure that they have parts, even if it's not the main melody. Um, you know, one thing I, I tend to favor, I really love polyphonic writing. I love melodies and counter melodies. And, you know, I'll try to sneak in some type of counter melody, even if that instrument group never got the melody. So they have something that is more engaging. Um, and so I, all of that has definitely impacted my writing. And sort of as a follow-up to that, and you kind of alluded to this earlier about why you made the decision to move um, fully to composing full-time. What was the decision like to leave teaching in terms of like relationships that you build with students over the course of 12 years? What was that sort of like making that decision to walk away from that, the most rewarding part of that job? Well, I mean, of course it was hard. Um, now I will say it was probably a little easier than I thought it was going to be um, afterwards, but um, the, making the decision was hard for lots of reasons. Um, you know, and you know, one thing I tell people, like, I'm a very practical person. Um, I'm a very middle person, like a very middle of the road. Um, so like, I'm not one of those pe people that says don't chase your dreams, but I'm also not one of those people that says don't don't try anything, you know, right. I'm like, I'm like, my, my thing is like, chase your dreams with caution. You know, <laughs> that's right. kind of my thing. And so, you know, the first thing, I mean, just on a practical level, the first thing I did was make sure I was going to be financially okay. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, cause I mean, it's scary. Like you're going from a, a steady job with a retirement plan and, you know, a you know, bi-weekly paycheck or whatever the term is bi-monthly twice a month, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And, um, <laughs> you know, to just basically surviving on commissions and royalties. And it's, it's scary, you know, that, so that was honestly the biggest thing. Now, as far as working with the kids, um, I mean, I really enjoyed working with the kids, um, you know, especially at that small school. And, you know, I would have students that were seniors in my band that I'd had taught for, you know, between seven to eight years. And um, so it, it was very difficult, but at the same time, um, and if this makes me sound selfish, that I'm selfish. I, you know, as I, as my life became busier um, and I started to, basically I had my life out of balance because I mean, I was just working 
Um, and if you don't mind me being very real, because I mean, I don't mind being very real. About sure. This. There were things going on. I mean, number one, my mental health was suffering. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just going to be very blunt about that. Um, I was stressed out from, you know, basically working two full-time jobs with no personal time. And I was on the, the brink of having a complete like mental breakdown. And then um, on top of that, like, you know, as I've mentioned earlier, you know, I'm, I'm married and you know, just celebrated 23 years uh, last Friday, you know, very, very proud of that. Congratulations. And, well, well, thank you. <laughs> um, but, you know, during, during the last year of that time uh, while I was teaching, uh, me and my husband uh, started really drifting apart. And it wasn't because like we weren't fighting. We weren't angry with each other. It wasn't anything like they show in the movies or anything like that, mm-hmm. but we just weren't interacting. And, you know, because there was no time, like it was, I was either working or I was uh, composing and it was kind of like my personal life was pushed off to the side. And so there just came this moment where I just kind of asked myself, I was like, is this the type of life you want to live? And the answer was a resounding no. And so, you know, when you decide that you have to start making some decisions that to other people might sound selfish, but, you know, ultimately the only person you can really take care of is you like period. And if you're not taking care of yourself, you're no use to anybody else. So, you know, I just had to make the decision that I wanted to be happy and healthy. And, um, you know, if that was selfish, it makes me selfish that I'm, I can live with that, you know? Um, but that was the hardest part was, uh, getting over the feeling of obligation. Like it's, Oh, I have to do this because don't get me wrong. I loved the band kids. I've got fond memories of them. They were amazing but if i would have stayed at that job in two years you know my juniors and seniors have been gone and you gotta had new kids but you know you can't really live your life for somebody else you have to live it for yourself and in in the best way you can and that's that's what i decided i think many many band directors myself included can empathize with that because i'm also married um I have two small children. Oh, congratulations. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, But it's very difficult to balance work itself and then all the extra stuff on top of that after school, you know, missing significant parts of my, my children's life. That's tough to, to balance. Yeah. And, and it, it, it takes effort. Right. Like, and I think that's the one thing that a lot of music educators, well, and just people in general, not just music educators, but people in general don't get is that a balanced life takes effort and kind of stewardship. You know, it's, uh, I mean, you have to be your own guardian, you know, and uh, you just have to be willing to say no occasionally. And and I know something else that you do is take care of yourself physically. I, I guess there's no one answer to this as well, but do you have any tips for balancing work and family and your own personal health physically and mentally? Um, well, I mean, I think the biggest thing is to um, set expectations and uh, and then just based on those expectations, kind of build in a schedule. Um, I mean, just to give you an example, I mean, I write a lot. I'm a full-time composer, but here's basically my schedule. I get up in the morning. I do my morning chores, like, you know, feed my dogs and and get everything ready, do some correspondence. And then I write from basically 8 o'clock a.m. until roughly 5 o'clock p.m. And then after that, I'm done. I don't care if I'm in mid-phrase. Once it is five o'clock, I'm done because after that it's family time. It's me and Steve time. It's video game time. It's dog time. You know, it's, it's time for me to have a life outside of this. And um, I don't work on the weekends. Um, I mean, unless now I will say occasionally I do only if like, you know, sometimes I get hit with that muse and like, and I'll go into my office and I will sketch down an idea. I will get enough information to know where to pick up on Monday, but I don't just sit there and obsess over it. Um, you know, and it's it's very easy for people who have this romanticized idea of composers and artists to, to kind of look at me and be disappointed when I tell them that. But I'm like, I'm taking care of myself. And because of the, because of the fact that I'm taking care of myself, I'm going to have longevity in this career. That's all great advice and something that I personally still struggle with six or seven years into my career. Yeah. Well, I mean, and again, it takes effort. Like, and I think, cause I think some people are always just saying, you know, like someday, someday this will happen right. or someday. So it bounce. No, it has to start today and it has to start with you deciding to do it.
Shifting gears just a little bit, um, you are published by a multitude of, of different publishing companies. I, I think like six or seven based on what I saw in your bio. Um, but, but recently, within the past year or so, you started up uh, Randall Standridge Music LLC. Yes. Um, for which, you know, you're your own editor and your own publisher. What, what led you to the decision to begin self-publishing your work? Um, well, it was a few things. Um, the biggest thing is that um, I, th I think sometimes people think like, oh, if you just write good music, people will publish it. And that is not true. In the band world, there are certain avenues that are open to people and certain avenues that are not. And based on your career, certain avenues can be open and certain avenues can be closed. Um, so one of the things that I discovered is, you know, I started most of my concert band career in young band writing. So like grade one, two, and three music, which I really enjoy writing and, and I think can be just as artistic as anything else. But I mean, I do enjoy writing grade four, five, and six and more advanced, you know, larger scope literature. The problem is um, if you start in academia, you know, and you write, you know, grade five and six, you make a name for yourself that way. And then you, de you deign to lower yourself to writing grade one and two, you're a, you're a genius. You know, but if you start in the grade one, two, and three, and you suddenly try to get out of your lane and write grade four, five, and six, you're a poser. You know, and that's, um, I mean, that's never said out loud, but it, 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 it sure as hell is implied pretty damn hard, you know? Um, so, uh, so it's just one of those things. So um, what I discovered was that many of my publishers, there, there was certain music that I wanted to write and get out there that they were just not willing to put out there because of who I was. Um, and I'm not faulting them for that because I mean, at its root, publishing is not about art. And I know that may sound harsh, but it's the truth. Um, publishing is about business. And I, you know, I am not a known quantity at that grade four, five, and six letter. So it's, it, you know, they're looking at, do we want to invest in this? And you have to keep in mind too, that the grade four, five, and six literature, the whole um, industry of it is a lot smaller than young band. There's just a bigger market for young band. So, you, I mean, you're dealing with a smaller clientele and very, very competitive. So the reason I decided to start my own, um, number one, um, it just gave me more creative control. And so I can try some things that you know may, may not have been tried elsewhere. Um, and then also to help me get some of that more advanced literature out there. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, I mean, I, I make no bones or, pre or pretense about the fact that I am a very much a social progressive. Um, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm not super political on social media, mainly because I don't really believe you're going to change anybody's mind by arguing with them on there. Agreed. That's, that's yeah. just my beliefs. You know, everybody mm -hmm. else, you know, feel free. To, if, if you disagree with me, please feel free to comment on, on your own blog. I'm sure you will. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, um, but I, I try to more or less do my political endeavors by example. I never tell people what they should think. I never tell people like, you should do this. I'm always just like, I'm doing this. I think this. And um, so with the company, one of our long-term goals is to eventually turn Randall Standard Music into a publishing group for a more diverse range of composers. Um, now that was the plan until COVID hit, but right now, uh, you know, the, I'm just going to be honest, like right now we're not publishing anybody else because I don't feel good about taking on anybody else's music in the current climate mm -hmm. because we don't know what sales are going to be like. We don't know how easy it is to get exposure out there um, since we are such a small company. And I, I don't want to confine somebody's music to my company at this point. That is going to change in the future, but you know, it's one of those things where, we just haven't yet. Um, so we're, we're going to be seeking out, you know, more diverse range of, of uh, composers to publish. And, and with that, a more diverse range of music. Because I think when you invite a diverse population of composers, you know, to the table, you're going to get music that you've never heard before. And I'm really excited about that. You know, and I don't just mean people, I mean like style. Um, you know, uh, just to give you an example, uh, one composer who's kind of emerged in the last few years that I've struck up a Facebook friendship with and just really admire his music is Omar Thomas. Um, and it's not, it's not just, you know, it's not just that he uh, comes from a different community, but it's his whole aesthetic is so different and it's so exciting. 
And that's what I love about it. And, and I think, you know, when you invite people and, and just, you know, and you don't expect them to sound like everybody else, that is exciting. And so that's what we hope to do in the future. Yeah. And I, I was lucky enough to meet Omar at Midwest and couldn't be a more like humble person that has just, you know, accomplished so much in the last couple of years. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It, hopefully he, he will, if he's listening, hopefully he'll be a guest on the show soon. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. Um, it's not just his difference in background. It's just that he's a truly unique composer that's bringing something new to the game right now. Yeah, but but what I meant by that is that I think, you know, when when, when you look at the older, and, and I don't mean in a bad way, but like the old guard of band composers, most of them had a similar life experience and a similar background. Um, so we there was a bit of a homogenized sound. And uh, as, you know, we've become more culturally aware as we are opening doors to more people, band music is changing. And I mean, even from people who are from, like, I mean, not to toot my own horn, but you know, why else am I on this podcast? But like, you know, I don't think 10 years ago, the music that I'm writing and the music that people like of mine would have been published um, because it's so different. And it's so, because I definitely, my, my heart is in the, is in pop culture. And, you know, my music is definitely influenced by that. And, you know, 10, 20 years ago, that would have been such a no-no, um, you know, so, but now, you know, it's the doors opening for lots of types of people and lots of points of view. Right. And one, one more quick question about your, your self-publishing. Um, I self-publish the majority of my work and it's incredibly taxing, uh, you know, writing everything, editing everything being responsible for the marketing, the printing, all those extra costs. How uh, does somebody like you that works on a much, much larger scale balance all of that? Do you do everything yourself? Do you oh, have oh no, no, team? no. I have help. I have help. <laughs> okay. um, now, I write all of my own music. There are no ghostwriters right. here. I write right. all my own music. You know? <laughs> uh, but um, no, I, we actually, we're a team of two. Um, so I do all the creative stuff and a lot of the marketing and uh, social media aspect. Um you know, got to get my TikTok dances up, you know, so people can, can laugh at <laughs> right. that. Um, so, uh, but anyway, uh, but now Steve, uh, my husband, he does the business side of things. So mm -hmm. he takes care of the, you know, making sure things get printed, making sure things get billed, uh, setting up with the distributors um, and, you know, kind of doing the day-to-day -day business. Uh, because if I had to do that, I would not be producing as much as I am. Um, and we're, you know, I mean, here's, here's what's exciting to me is, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, which I was, I was like, of course, out of all the years, like the year that I start my company <laughs> of all the years, <laughs> this has to happen. You know, I mean, I mean, and I'm not griping too much. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, my life is great. So, you know, I'm not going to gripe too much because I'm, I'm healthy, I'm happy and I'm doing what I love, but still, you know, there's that little bit of, of uh, bitterness of just like, like really like any other year, any other year, but the year that <laughs> I'm starting this. Um, and incidentally, you know, one of my pieces that came out this year that was kind of prescient, you know, right out of the gate was Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and so, I, um, yeah, I, I was talking to Brian Balmage, he, he's a friend of mine. And uh, we, we love talking to each other because we, we're both pretty quick witted and, and mm -hmm. a little bit snarky. And so we, we love just, you know, bantering back and forth. He, he's, he's one of my favorite people in the world, by the way. Uh, but uh, we were talking, like, he had this big piece come out earlier this year. It was this big, like, social media thing. I think it was, like, mm -hmm. love and light or something like that. Yes. And, yeah. and I just, I started laughing because we were talking. I was like, Brian, I was like, of course, of course. I was like, you write of love and light. And what did I release? The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. <laughs> I, like, I was like, this is, like, either the best timing ever or the worst. Um. But anyway, uh, so regardless of that, though, the, I mean, this year has actually been pretty good. Like our people have responded really well to our company, um, which we've been rolling with the punches pretty well. You know, we've put, we instantly got things together to put out for um, flex arrangements and for us from other things and um, made our pieces very online friendly. Um, and actually, most of our catalog should be on smart music pretty soon. Awesome. Um, but um but we may like if things keep going the way they're going by next year, we're probably going to have to hire another person um, at least part time to fill orders. 
um, just to, I mean, just basically their job will be to ship music. Like it'll just be a part-time thing, but, uh, right. but you know, I mean, the big, the big goal is for me and him to be done at five o'clock every day and for me to not drive myself crazy and for, <laughs> and or crazier and my, uh, and for my primary responsibility to be to write the music. Mm-hmm. And side note, I absolutely love Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. I, I'm naturally like drawn towards darker music. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's kind of my style. So I can't wait to be able to program that. Oh, well, thank you. Well, and we're, uh, we're, we're actually working on modifying it right now. Um, awesome. For um, what I'm calling modular wind ensemble. So it's not, not the same thing as flex. Um, I enjoy writing flex, but you know, as a composer, because to me, such a big part of composition is orchestration. And flex totally wipes that out. Like it just, it just does. Um, but this modular idea is just basically, you know, it's just written for a smaller group. You know, it could be achieved by a small group or it can be played by a large group, you know, but still sound good. Um, so I'm doing a, another edition of that one that, and it should, we're hoping to have it out in the next couple months. Um, that will be, you know, more, my goal is to make it where it can be played by as few as 13 players. Um, because right now there's no way it's too massive. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. That would be perfect for an ensemble like mine. I teach in rural Western Pennsylvania. And right now, because of COVID kids being online, some kids being in school, our biggest ensemble is only like 22 kids at the moment. So yeah. modular yeah. wind ensemble pieces would be perfect for what I'm dealing with. Yeah. I've got one out right now. It was our first one that we kind of tested the concept with. Um, it's a grade three. It's called, it's an arrangement of um, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, um, which was also kind of just inspired by my reflection on everything that's going on with uh, our kind of reckoning and awakening about social justice right now. Um, I find a lot of comfort in that song. And uh, that, yeah, that was not a commission. It was just something I wanted to write. And, uh, but it, but I was also like, okay, you know, how do we make it relevant for now so it's like well we're in this covid world so modular wind ensemble and it really turned out beautifully Mm -hmm. i agree i I listened to what you posted on facebook and it's beautiful so congratulations with that um speaking of uh four horsemen of the apocalypse that's one of the pieces included on your album that you just recently released um a new day dawns yes um and like i said earlier in the interview it's an incredibly eclectic sort of snapshot of your work as a composer. I have a few general questions first, if you could um, explain for everybody in case they haven't listened to it yet. Um, just some general background on on the album, like um, how long had that sort of been in progress before you released it earlier this year? I think, was it after the shutdown that you actually released the album? Uh, yeah, it was released in uh, July. Okay. So it's, it's fairly recent, yeah. Um, but anyway, the background was, um, I, I'm, I'm just one of those people that I don't take no for an answer. Like mm-hmm. I just, I just really don't. Um, and there, there was this, um, there was this quote I saw about four years ago that really spoke to me. Um, and it's, it, I mean, it wasn't about music in particular, but it was just something to the effect it said, if the opportunity does not exist, create it. And so, you know, I think there are so many, composers and voices out there who just kind of sit around and wait for things to happen. You know, it's like, I'm going to wait for the Eastman Wind Ensemble to decide to do an album, all of my music, you know, or I'm going to wait to, you know, for the North Texas groups to, you know, record an album just of just my, or to just include one piece on it, you know. And I just, you know, decided, I was like, well, you know, I could wait around for that or I can just produce my own damn album, you know, <laughs> and just, you know, and kind of take the reins. So I started researching you know, like, how difficult is it really to put together an album and to release it? And what I happily discovered was that it really wasn't that difficult. I mean, it takes money, but as far as like, is it hard? No, it's not that hard. And so, um, you know, I started generating ideas and right around that same time, I just, I felt like I had this breakthrough in my writing. Um, Cause I, I mean, I, there are certain pieces and certain moments in my career that I can point to and be like, that's a moment where I took a step forward as a composer. And so I had, I've had several of those the past few years. I, I really feel like I'm finally kind of blossoming. Um, and um, so I had this collection of pieces that I was really proud of. I was like, you know, these make a good album. These are the ones that I would want people to hear if they were going to you know, listen to my stuff. And so I just put together uh, this album and recorded it with a studio group. 
um, which was uh, the Lodge Wind Ensemble in um, Indianapolis. And uh, that, I mean, that's pretty much it. Like, I mean, I wish there was a bigger story, but we did that. Um, <laughs> I, re I released it through this service called CD Baby. Mm -hmm. um, that is C, the letter C, the letter D, not CD as in like, you know, scandalous or anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh but so cd baby and uh, i mean it was an easy process and uh you know the uh i'm actually gonna uh, one thing i'm working on right now is figuring out how to do some publicity for it because I, you know i it, it all kind of came around at a weird time i mean with the covid thing and with everything else going on um you know normally you would try to build buzz about one and then release it and i think we're gonna have to do this the other way around um but anyway it yeah you know, it got released and i'm very proud of it the goal was never to make money the goal was to uh, number one get really re you know top quality recordings of all this music and then second like can i create an album like can i do that and it's ba to me it's basically a stepping stone because i'm going to be doing this again like this is not a one and done i've already got plans for the next three albums um and uh you know all with their own kind of themes and goals and uh so this was also a learning opportunity for me um, to learn how to do this and to get better at it. Um, and that, you know, so hence the title, A New Day Dawns. For me, it's, it's kind of about me starting a new chapter as a composer and taking myself more seriously, not in the sense of losing what I think is the fun of my music, but just dreaming bigger. You know, it's, um, I, I, I don't think you need to be limited in your scope. I mean, like, yeah, I, I may not ever get to the heights that I want to reach, but, you know, sitting, sitting on my ass, I sure, I sure am not, you know, mm, right. <laughs> you know, you've, you've got to get up and do something. And the worst thing people can tell you is no. And yeah, you know, it's, 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 and then, you know, you're literally no worse off than you were before. So, um, so I don't know. I, t I tend to dream big and this album was part of that. And uh, I'm really proud of it. I've actually considered like as a publicity thing, doing a limited vinyl print run of it since vinyl is kind of a big thing right now. That's awesome. And uh, I know one person who would be interested in that uh, sitting here. <laughs> so uh, I think it's really cool how you sort of included um, recorded program notes throughout each of the, the four sections. Um, could you give everybody sort of like a brief description of each of those four sections and the pieces that you chose for each? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it's, uh, I mean, the, the idea for program notes is just to me, as we've moved more away from the physical world of music, uh, by which I mean, you know, like you don't get CDs anymore. I mean, some people do, you know, some people still get vinyls and CDs and things like that. But generally speaking, we've really moved into a digital space with music. And so a lot of people never get program notes. Like, you know, used to, you'd open the, the LP you know, sleeves, you'd open the CD thing and have the little booklet and you could read about that. Cause like, I, you know, I remember the first several um, albums that I got, the very first of which was um, a CD of Mazorski's Night on Bald Mountain. Um, the, you know, which in, inside it had program notes, had a biography of Mazorski, things like that. You really don't get that anymore. And so, to me, the program notes, it, it was a, the audio ones was a chance to just basically kind of, you know, have that moment digitally um, and have it in a format that I thought was conversational, almost kind of sounded audio book ish, you know, and uh, just give people a better appreciation for that. Because, you know, one of the things with instrumental music, um, instrumental music, even when it has the best story and the best intent behind it, is an abstract experience. And I will argue this to my dying day. I know there's people who are like, oh, no, it's a, it can be. No, it can't. It doesn't have words. It doesn't paint a picture. It's harmony, rhythm, and sounds and textures. It's abstract, period. And you need to approach it that way if you're going to make it successful. <laughs> you know. Um, so, But, you know, because instrumental music is so abstract, I, sometimes that little extra note can help people appreciate it more. And so that was the intent. Um, as far as the, the pieces, um, I'll, I'll try to give you a brief rundown and I'll, I'll keep mm -hmm. these as short as possible. And I'll make sure to link to to the album um, on Spotify and wherever else it's available so folks can listen. Okay. Oh yeah, it's it's available on Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes. Um, it's supposed to be available eventually on Pandora, but I don't think it's up yet. I think they're just dragging their feet. But And it's also on Google Play and all that stuff. Um, 
but anyway so the pieces i included um the album kicks off with one of my newer works for young band called earth dawn which is very world music very like this 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 would feel right at home in epcot like in disney or or, or um, at the animal kingdom <laughs> you know, like it's it's very that kind of cinematic world music um cel celebratory thing and it's really fun um then uh, probably my favorite piece on the album is the uh, second actual music track, uh, which is Stonewall 1969, which I consider to be the best thing I've ever written. I mean, like if I had to say, you know, what is my crowning jewel as a composer right now? That is it. Um, because I don't think any piece I've written better exemplifies what I really believe in as a composer, because it is the ultimate marriage of like pop and symphonic. Um, so much so that I actually wrote two original pop songs that are in the world of the piece that have lyrics. You know, we, we had a singer um, who was my friend, Derek Palmer, who if you, uh, for those of you that haven't heard the album yet, if nothing else, just listen to it for him. He is such an incredible vocalist. Um, and the fact that he has not been discovered and made a star is a crime against humanity. Um, he's just amazing. Um, but the piece, it, it combines uh, symphonic with... Um, you know, a vocalist and then um, beat poetry to create this portrait of New York in 1969 uh, during the Stonewall riots, which was the beginning of the gay rights movement. Um, and it's it's a very uh, evocative piece and it's 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 fun, but it's also angry and it's it's a lot of things. Um, and so it's just really fun. Then uh, Deus Ex Machina um, it's basically sounds like concert band mixed with dubstep and techno um, and it's this really kind of weird take on um, an almost bolero-esque melody that just grows and grows but has this groove underneath it um, then there's vanishing point which what was funny was when vanishing point when we were recording the album it was really my least favorite when we were going into the recording session, keeping in mind that I had never heard it live. I mean, it had been premiered by the premiere group, but the only like album thing I'd really heard was like a YouTube recording, which, you know, is very flat and very just like somebody's camera, you know, somebody's uh, phone, you know, microphone. So it, I mean, don't get me wrong. The group that premiered it sounded great, but it's just, you know, I didn't get excited about it because it didn't sound like it really sounds. So we got into the recording session and that was the very first thing we recorded was uh, Vanishing Point. And um, we started playing it and I was just like, and I just had that moment, which, and, and again, it makes me sound like a braggart. I'm not, but it was just like, I was just like, wow. I was like, this sounds so much better than I thought it was going to. <laughs> and it's actually turned into one of my favorite pieces on the album. Um, it's, it's really exciting. Um, it's very John Adams by way of Philip Glass, but with a cinematic sensibility, <laughs> you know, and uh, so it's minimalistic, but fun. Then there's the uh, garden suite, um, three movements of the garden suite. Um, we actually decided to cut one of the movements. It originally had all four. Um, the garden suite is comprised, it's a young band suite comprised of frogs, flowers, and bees. There's also March of the Arachnids, but I don't know, as we listened to the album, a March just seemed out of place. And as much, you know, it would have been nice to have the whole suite on it, but at the same time, I'm not so married to it that I was like, eh, you know, I want the album to make sense and to feel organic as the listener goes through it. And as I listened to it, every time it got to March of the Arachnids, it just, I don't know, it felt silly and it felt like it just stopped the momentum of the album. And uh, not that I don't like the piece. I love the piece, but it's, you know, for the purposes of the album, we only wanted three of the movements. Um, and then uh, there's when the spring rain begins to fall, which is one of my older pieces. Um, but I would say it is one of the first ones where I really connected with what would become my compositional style, which is that kind of popsy symphonic. That's the very first piece I wrote that sounded like that. And I remember just intensely loving it when I was writing it. And so I wanted to include that. Uh, then there's Havana Nights, which is just my love of mambo music brought to life. So I actually envisioned it as a uh, ballet. And I would love to see somebody you know, uh, bring it to life that way. I mean, it's just, you know, seven minutes. So just be like a very short kind of art installation ballet. So if anybody is listening to this and wants to stage that, hit me up. We can totally make that happen. Um, and then there's uh, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, uh, which is a suite um, that was uh, um, 
commissioned by Colorado Mesa University. And uh, it's it's very like, it's just my, my love of, of cinematic symphonic sounds. Um, not, not anything really pops about it other than it's in that cinematic mode, you know. Um, then we have The Nine, which is another piece that kind of deals with social justice. And um, it was written about the Little Rock Central Nine. It's another one of those that I think is one of my favorites. Um, just because there's not a single note of it, I would I would change. Like it's, I think it's not not everything I write is perfect. But if if there was something I wrote that was perfect, that's probably about as close as I've gotten. Um, and then just for fun, um, I I took the two pop songs out of Stonewall and included them as bonus tracks, along with karaoke tracks because I am a karaoke fiend. And I was like, somebody could totally sing along with this. It'd be it'd be fun. Um, and I think we're going to actually like, especially since both of those, you know, deal with Stonewall and everything. I think next June when Pride Month rolls around, we're going to do some like online social media challenges for people to like do their best karaoke and put it up, you know, so that, <laughs> that'll be a lot of fun. That's awesome. Um, and folks that are listening, make sure you check out the album. I, I've listened to it actually a few times just today. Um, and it, it's a really fun listen from beginning to end. It's something different every track and every section of it. It's really enjoyable. So if you enjoy concert band music, make sure you check it out. Yeah, and let me give a special shout out real quick to um, the musicians that are included. Like I mentioned, Derek Palmer, the vocalist. Um, and the, you know, there's the Lodge Wind Ensemble, which is mainly comprised of band directors and um, uh, orchestral musicians from the Indianapolis area. They were great, very easy to work with. And then lastly, um, a lot of the, the recordings of my older pieces, um, parts of the uh, Garden Suite, um, the nine and uh, when the spring rain begins to fall, we're all recorded by uh, the University of Northern Colorado bands um, who've done a lot of the recording sessions for Grand Mesa music. And they were always very easy to work with, always did great recording. So, you know, just want to make sure I acknowledge them and thank them for their hard work on this. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I have one more question. Sure. Um, it's arguably the most important question I've asked you so far, and I'm sorry that I, I saved like the heaviest topic for last year, but you mentioned your two pieces, Stonewall 1969 and, and The Nine, that are sort of, you know, like socially conscious pieces. Something that I've personally been struggling with lately is to write or not to write about, you know, the current social unrest that's happening in America. And, and you know, I want to be an ally to to people who face injustices on a daily basis. Um, and the best way that I personally know how to make my voice heard is through my art. But, you know, I lack the perspective, um, you know, that's needed to accurately portray what's currently happening. Well, I see what you're getting at. And there's, I, I have some very complex feelings on this. So um, for those of you that are listening, um, before you take me to task on social media on anything I'm about to say, um, please know that, uh, I mean, it really, I really consider it to be complex and I probably won't even be able to get all of my feelings about it out in just this brief conversation. Um, I think, but well, I'll just use myself as an example. Um, so like Stonewall 1969, I mean, I, I am part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so my perspective on that was personal. You know, I have lived that. I have experienced, um, you know, discrimination because of my sexuality um, and because of my life. Um, so for that piece, you know, I, I could write and speak to it very personally. When I was writing The Nine, which is, you know, The, the Little Rock uh, Nine um, and the whole thing that happened there, it's such an experience that is particular to the African-American community. Um, that was one of the things I felt like I had to be very careful about in, and not, not in writing the piece, but in how I approached it. Um, and I think what you're getting at is what I was feeling there. It's like, how do I comment on something when I'm not part of that population? And so what I think you have to do, I, I think a lot of it, number one, comes from the approach. And then the second part comes from the intent, because people can... And this is where I disagree with a lot of people that argue on social media. I do think intent matters. 
And I think if you are divorcing a work from the composer's intent, that you are usurping its value for your own. So, and that's a whole other conversation. But um, like when I wrote the nine, I struggled at first because I didn't want to presume to speak for the nine or for anybody in the African-American community because I'm, I'm, and I'm a 43 year old white guy. I could never know what that experience is like and I never will. Um, I can empathize, I can become educated, I can be an ally, like you said, and I can champion causes, but that is still not the same as living it, you know. However, I, what I could comment on was my reaction to everything. Because for me, the nine, it's not supposed to speak for the nine. And it's not supposed to speak for anybody. It is my reaction to what is going on and how I feel about it. Um, because ultimately, that, that's what a good artist should do is say, I believe this and I think this. And when that is the intent and it's and you're not speaking for somebody and you're not saying, well, you know, I'm representing this population even though I'm not part of it. I think it's a different ball game uh, because, uh, and I mean, I'll, I'll even give you some examples. Uh, you know, when I was writing The Nine, um, I, you know, I created my own spiritual. Like I didn't use a previously written one because um, you know, I didn't want to write something that was a traditional because um, you know, then I felt like that would be taking from that community to speak for them. Um, so I created my own because then the message is totally my own. Um, and then you know, I also, I'm not gonna lie, I struggled a little bit with that with the Precious Lord arrangement, but the difference there is Precious Lord was actually written by a specific composer. It's not a traditional, it's not just a, you know, like this, you know, this is from our tradition. It was written by one particular composer and is in public domain. Um, so, you know, I think when composers want to do that, like for instance, Jeff, if you, if you were to want to write a piece about like Stonewall or about the Pulse shootings or, you know, about anything or, or a celebration of marriage rights, you know, that were granted in 2015, you could do that. You would just have to make sure that you were approaching it from a place of how you reacted to it, as opposed to, oh, I'm going to speak for them. And that's exactly what I was asking. Advice for somebody that is not part of that community, but supporting them. Yeah. Now, having said that, please keep in mind that we are living in the social media age. And even with the best intentions, there will still be people that will take you to task no matter what you do. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but you know as rupaul once said <laughs> as if they if they ain't paying your bills don't pay them no mind you know right. and so um you know that's one thing uh, becoming a public figure and becoming somebody who is so active on social media and things i've i've had to learn to let go of a few things mm -hmm. because i'm not gonna i mean i've gotten hate mail i've gotten negative comments i've gotten all kinds of stuff and if i allowed that to get to me number one i would never create art again because i'd be too afraid and number two, I would just never sleep because I'd be upset all the time. So you just can't make, you know, all you know, like I know when I write my pieces, I know what my intent is. I know what I'm trying to say. And if I offend somebody, I apologize. But at that point, that's all I can do. You know, and, um, and they'll either accept it or they won't. And I can't control that, you know. Um, but, you know, like the nine was received very well. And I think people understood its intent. You know, so uh, so I I don't think you have to be from a population to write about issues like that. I think you can be an ally and provide commentary. I just think you need to make sure that it's coming from the correct place and from the correct perspective. Very well said and good advice. Thank you. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about before I do the quick couple wrap up questions? Um, well, I mean, we are in the Halloween season. If you've got time, I just uh -huh. want to tell you about the stupidest thing I ever did. Like, and it's, <laughs> and it's Halloween related. Okay. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I love scary movies. I love, you know, horror uh, novels. I mean, I'm a big Stephen King reader, you know, things like that. That just melts my butter. I am like, you know, all into that. <laughs> now, having said that, I am one of those people that will talk back to the screen so like, you know, the, the dumb, the dumb teenagers wander into the obviously abandoned house, you know, with these, you know, with the body parts hanging off of it. And I'm just like, why would they do that? I would never <laughs> do that. That is the dumbest thing. That is not how people would react in real life. 
Okay, so one time I went to this abandoned house, and uh, I was gonna I was gonna photograph it. Um, I, I have this interest in photography; it's one of my hobbies. And there's this just kind of creepy house, and I wanted to get some pictures of it. And it was snowing this particular day, and so it was really pretty. You had like the stark white, you know, with the the dark you know wood of the house. I was like, these are gonna make great you know pictures, and they did. But anyway, so I'm wandering around there, and I was like, all right, you know, I wonder what it looks like inside. So I go inside the house and it's creepy. And I, I mean, the reason I like scary movies is because they genuinely scare me. So I mean, like, I mean, I'm not like fearless. I don't even pretend to be. So <laughs> I, so I go in there and I'm getting myself good and freaked out. And it just, I mean, the house is a wreck. It looks like the type of place, you know, a murder would happen in. And I, and I've got that little voice in my head telling me this and I'm getting more and more scared. <laughs> so I go into the, the living room area and there's a mattress just laying there. Um, and so, I mean, the thought occurs to me, you know, instantly I'm like, somebody could be staying here. Like there could be some, you know, crazy person here that, you know, or, you know, the things I'm invading their space, I need to get out of here. So I turn around and there's all these like crazy messages spray painted on the wall. And I mean, I'm just like, I mean, I feel like I just walked into, you know, one of my horror movies and, um, then from the back of the house, like there's this ha- there's this hallway going from the living room to the back of the house where I can't quite see the back of the house. I hear a thump. <laughs> and here's where, you know, Randall Standridge goes stupid. Do I leave? No, I stand there and I literally do this. I stand there and I go. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, like inside my head, I'm going, what the hell are you doing? You've seen every horror movie. Like, you know that you need to leave. Like, uh, but, but, and so do I leave? No, I inch closer to the dark hallway going off into the back of the house, lean my head in a little bit and say, hello. (laughs) And then a few things happen at once. I hear another bam and I see like some shadowy movement. And so I run and I go outside, but it, it was snowing and you really can't run in the snow. Right. And I mean, I, I didn't trip or anything like, it was nothing like that, but like you can't wrestle. Like I had, I had like that fight or flight thing going on. So I turn around and there's nobody there. Do I leave? No, I start inching my way around the house to see if I could see whoever this was that I thought was back there. And so I get to the back of the house. The win- There's a window open in the back room where the sound was coming from. And there was a closet door that was getting caught in the wind and slamming. (laughs) And so I kind of relax, but then I look down at the ground and there are footprints in the snow leading off into the woods. And I'm not making that up. Like I'm getting chills right now talking about it. (laughs) And so I got in my car and I left, but, but to this day, I don't talk back to horror movies anymore because I'm like, yes, you you would do that. that." It's like, you don't get to say you wouldn't do that anymore. So so that's a good Halloween story for your listeners. That's great. And thank you for helping end this on on a lighter note there. Um, Have you, have you ever written a piece uh, like based on that experience? Not based on that experience, but, um, but I have written some pretty ghoulish things that I love. Mm -hmm. I've got a piece out called um, the witching hour that I really love. Mm -hmm. Um, It's very Danny Elfman, very, you know, like that whole that. Um, I wrote a Christmas piece called a Christmas tale. Beware the Krampus. That is about the scary side of Christmas. Um, which is one of the pieces I got hate mail for, by the way. Yeah, I, um, I've heard yeah. I've heard stories. And uh, <laughs> then uh, I've also written some marching shows. Um, my favorite of which is this show called The Presence. Um, I don't want to say anything else about it other than it's basically a horror movie for marching band. That's awesome. And, That's right up my should, alley. Yeah, you should check you should check it out. Like I, it was one of those I was almost actually afraid to release. I was like, people are going to be so offended by this show. Um. And uh, so it's it's creepy, but I but I like it. So and and I've got some ideas for some other things that I'm writing. I, I'm definitely allowing that part of my personality to come out more in my writing. I mean, I enjoy writing other stuff too, but there's I definitely have a ghoulish, darker side. I'm exactly the same, so I can understand. Um, I, I know that you're super in demand in terms of uh, marching band design and commissions, but um, if anybody wanted to reach out to you and wanted to commission you. How could they do that? Uh, best way would be to um, check out my website. Uh, it has a lot of contact information on it, which is uh, randallstandridge.com. Um, I'm also all over social media. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on TikTok, um, Instagram, uh, Twitter. You know, so you're, I mean, feel free to reach out that way. 
um, or just uh, at my email, you know, which is uh, Randall Standridge at yahoo.com. You know, real creative. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure to uh, include all of that and links to all of that in the, in the show description. Um, Randall, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. You've given me more than an hour of your time and I know how valuable that is. So thank you so much, sir. Oh, no problem. Thank you for having me. Composer Disclosure is produced by Jeff Herwig and is a product of Eminem Music Press, LLC. Music in today's episode include Freedom by Jeff Herwig and Vanishing Point by Randall Standridge. Special thank you to Randall for allowing us to use a recording of his music throughout today's episode. Please be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you like to consume your podcasts.